Good morning. Welcome to worship this week as we continue to celebrate Easter. Remember, Lent is only 40 days, but we have a full seven weeks to celebrate Easter. So when you see things like the Easter lilies out there, we are not being lazy. It's still Easter season. Today, if you're here in person, you may notice a change in the bulletin, specifically that it's gone back to the old style. And old just means a year ago, but it's where we just have one page instead of recently we've had lots of pages and all of the notes are not in here, meaning if you want all the notes, this hymnal, which the CDC says is now okay to touch things again, you could open this up and find the pages on setting four. It starts at 147. That's all the liturgy things. And then all the songs are in the back. We're making this change because we've changed the bulletin so many times this year. We're trying to figure out what works best. So if you have a strong opinion or just an opinion, you can let me know or someone else on worship and music know how you like things. Do you like all the notes? Do you like saving paper? Where do you fall? We're just trying to figure things out again. Speaking of figuring things out, we've had some technical difficulties. Hopefully, um, if you've been in, here in person, you might not know it, but if you're online, you know that over the last month, ever since one of our programs updated, we've been freezing, sometimes me in crazy positions like this, and then for the rest of the service, you can just watch me like this. It's a weird thing. Every week, we've been trying new and different ways to fix it. This week, we've tried two new things. Hopefully, it works. If it doesn't, please enjoy that you can still hear and see all the words and just know that each week we're trying something new. We'll have cleanup day here on May 1st and the 15th, so you can join us next Saturday as we beautify the church. Um, and then, of course, again on the 15th, you can look out in the narthex for the list of things we need help with. And then today, Abby is going to come and talk to us a little bit about VBS. Good morning. 
Um, today I want to talk about Vacation Bible School. This year we're lucky to have camp counselors from Green Lake Bible Camp come and lead our Vacation Bible School. So VBS this year will be from Sunday, June 27th through Thursday, July 1st. Our counselors will be with us that Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. worship service to help us lead worship. And then after, from 10 a.m. till noon, that will be the first time that VBS will be um, active. In that time, there will be activities. We are planning to tie-dye shirts with the kids, and VBS is open for those three years of age, for those that are potty trained through sixth grade, for the rest of the week, Monday through Thursday. VBS will be from 9 a.m. until 12 p.m. of that week. There will be snacks for the kids during the morning. In the North X, there are registration forms from Green Lake. They ask that each child uh, fills one out individually. On the back of the registration form at the bottom, there is uh, just a little area that we're going to ask for your child size for a t-shirt to do the tie-dye activity. If you guys are able to start getting those registration forms into me so I can take note, and so then I can start getting t-shirts for all the kids for that tie-dye activity. Um, if you would also like to be a volunteer for the week, please also let us know. We're hoping to have as many kids as we've had in the past. So if you would like to be a volunteer, also let me know that. And then just a reminder, I'm still looking for one family to host two counselors for the week of VBS. If you have questions about that, I'm more than happy to talk to you after service, but we are still looking for one family to host um, two of our counselors. Thank you. Thank you, and to those grandparents out there, this might be the great week to take your grandkids and then pawn them off on VBS from nine to noon every day so you get a break and then you can see them all afternoon. Just a suggestion, I'm not a grandparent yet, so I don't know how that all works. We today are, have flowers up here for Lane Gowdy and for Lauren Reisler. We are very excited about those births into our family. Also, Jack and Leah Dobbs welcomed baby boy Reese Dobbs yesterday morning, which means Abe and Jean are now grandparents, which we're very excited for. Congratulations on that. So we thank the Lord for all of the blessings of kids being brought into the world and into our community these days. We're praying for Toby Kotala, who is going through hip replacement surgery tomorrow on Monday. He is brother to Linda Olson. Please keep him in your prayers. We now continue with confession and forgiveness. Please open your bulletin and stand. We begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins the presence of God and of one another. Take a moment, confess your sins before God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of God and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with praise the Lord, rise up rejoicing.
Praise the Lord, rise up rejoicing, worship, thanks, devotion, voicing. Glory be to God on high. Christ, your cross and passion sharing, by this Eucharist declaring, yours the final victory. Scattered flock, one shepherd sharing, lost and lonely, one voice hearing, Here's attentive to your word. By your blood new life receiving, in your body firm believing, we are yours and you the Lord. Sins forgiven, wrongs forgiving, we go forth alert and living in your spirit strong and free. Partners in your new creation, seeking peace in every nation, may we faithful followers be. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing and honor and glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Oh, alleluia, alleluia. Please join with me in prayer. 
fulfillment of the prophecies, with scripture and water you claim people as your own. Claim us with water and the word so that we may rejoice in the life given to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the sake of the one whose spirit lives in us, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. We invite the children to come forward. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome today. Uh, our sermon today is going to deal with a special day that happened last Thursday. It was April 22nd, just three days ago. Does anybody know what special day that was? Yes, sir. You nailed it. It's Earth Day. So I want you to listen very carefully to a song that the congregation is going to sing. One verse of This Is My Father's World. Belinda, what number is it? 824. If you can turn to 824 and just listen, because they're going to talk about the rocks and the hills and the seas and the sky and nature singing all in the first verse. If you sing, don't go right in. Right. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the sphere. This is my father's world. You in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and sea. And <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. What a great song to think about our Earth Day with, which was Thursday. What a beautiful day it was Thursday. The sun was shining. It was gorgeous. Although every day has something special, certainly deal, dealing with it. Now, God's created a whole bunch of people to take care of this earth. And they're all called stewards. And every one of you is a steward. I might let Eric off for right now. Yes, yet he's probably creating more of a mess than he's cleaning up. But anyway, I would say all of us, even you young people up here, probably are pretty close to becoming stewards. And a steward is somebody who watches over something. To just keep it in good shape. You know, we have Mr. Robbins up there. He tries to keep this church in real good shape. He's not the only steward, but he's the main steward of our church. But we all have an equal role to play in our earth. We want to keep it nice like God created it. So we all want to be good stewards. Now, I've been a few places around the world. I wish I could say I've been everywhere, but there are beautiful things. I mean, I've seen beautiful mountains. Sometimes I think I'm right there next to God when you're walking up to a high mountain. And sometimes I see the vast ocean. And what we want to do is keep all that stuff just the way God created it. This huge ocean and these wonderful mountains. And I, I used to think, oh man, you have to leave this area to really see beautiful. I mean, there's beautiful stuff all over the world. Gail, my wife Gail, her aunt came in from San Diego and when she's flying in, we're just saying, oh, how beautiful it is in San Diego and how wonderful it is. She said, there's no place more beautiful than where you guys live. You have rolling hills. You have beautiful lakes. You have wonderful streams. She came at the end of July when all the fields were green as ever. 
We had plenty of rain, and it was just beautiful. She just loved the way it looked. So right here in our Das Cocado area, we have beautiful land, and we want to be good stewards. So anytime you get a chance, anytime you get a chance, take care of God's creation. He created this, and he made us all stewards. Not just a few people. No, all of us. So keep that in mind. Um, let's pray real quickly. Wonderful God, thank you for creating this beautiful world. Help us be very good stewards of the earth. And help us keep this earth a beautiful place to live. Excellent. Now, I know God also created the sun and the stars. That's why I have to have a reason to eat something. So, uh, yeah, funny girl. But I have a starburst because of that. I can't hide, I can't hide anything from my grandkids. They know just where the food is. Oh, 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 hands down, hands down, hands down. And I will put a starburst here for everyone. You come and I will put them out of the bag. Uh, 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 no, you stand in the line. You stand in the line, please. Thank you. There you go. One, one, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Grab a quick starburst. And keep the stars in mind, too. They're beautiful. And we got a big full moon coming up tonight or tomorrow. You certainly can, you sure can, you sure can. Go ahead, kids. Just grab anyone you'd like. We continue reading Psalm 23, responsively by whole verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O, God, o Lord, and guide me along right pathway for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today's reading will come from Acts 8, verses 26 through 39. I will say, when I read this, I found it very confusing because there are so many pronouns that I am going to take the liberty of putting proper nouns in some of those places so you can better understand who's saying what here. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So Philip got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official for Queen Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. And the eunuch was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot, and the eunuch was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard the eunuch reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And then the eunuch invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, which refers to the crucifixion. 
Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his, humil in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does that prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to the eunuch the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look here, water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? And the eunuch commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Word of God, word of life. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Lord, Lord, Lord. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise up from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So today I've seen some of you grabbing these hymnals, right? And opening them up, which is great, especially with that first hymn, we needed just a little bit of the notes there to help us along. And I thought, what a great day to also have us grab the Bible. So, these Bibles, you could have brought one from home, you can open that one too. But otherwise, I'm going to have one representative from every family grab the Bible, and we're going to have a race to see who can find the reading first, right? So don't start, we're going to start. You're looking for Acts 8.37, go ahead and raise your hand when you found it. Maybe we'll give you some starbursts. Tom, can I give them a starburst? Okay, you get a starburst if you find it first. Go. Well, Tim, you obviously started first. How many other people found it? X837. So where do you find that, Tim? 888. 889. Oh, okay. Does everybody see it there? Eight thirty-seven. How many people are having trouble finding it, like Tim? Yes, some of us are having some trouble finding it here, right? So, Tim, where did you find it? It should be. Bet oh, no starburst for him. I'm sorry, Perrin. Your dad just yeah. So. It's very interesting, right? Because all of us, and some of us assumed we'd found it when we picked the page. Tim is actually right, though. It is on 889. If you go down to this little box of contextual notes, you will find it. So there in this fine print, we say, it's for under 836, other ancient authorities add all or most of the verse 37. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he, meaning the eunuch, replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So Tim, I was afraid you'd actually found it, right? And the pastor said, here's what you should do. You should offer $100 for the person who finds it. I said, no, because Tim's going to find it, and then I'll owe him $100.
But that is an odd thing, because we all know it should be right there between 36 and 37, and I was afraid one of you had brought the King James Version, because if you look with the King James Version, you find it right there. But most of your Bibles, if you have any sort of modern version of the Bible, that won't be there. That verse has been moved to the far corner where most of us, let's be honest, just don't read that part of every page of the Bible. There's always a little corner that says things like, or this could be read in this alternate word, or this name might be spelled with a Z instead of the X. And you go, yeah, I don't really mind that part. I'll just skip that box. But let's for a moment then talk about the Bible itself. Because the Bible did not first appear like this book that you have in, in front of you. In fact, it was written over the course of many, many years and is 66 different books, right? So that's why if you're reading Ezekiel and then you skip over to John, the reading, the writing seems a little bit different because Ezekiel was written by a different guy than the guy who wrote John, right? Now, it was inspired by the same person. The Holy Spirit worked through all of it, so it all faithfully tells the story of Scripture. However, God can be inspiring me in this sermon and Pastor Joe in his sermon, and they sound a little different, don't they? You're like, oh yeah, that sermon's by Pastor Tim, and the other sermon, that one's Pastor Joe, which you can tell if you listen to either of us on a regular basis. And yet both can speak the truth about Jesus. And now there's other differences, of course. The Old Testament was not even written on paper, right? The Old Testament is written on animal skins. And the New Testament was written without any spaces at all, right? In their world, well, first, in the ancient world, when the Old Testament was written, they didn't have paper, so they had to write it on animal skins. In the New Testament world, paper was so valuable, you couldn't take time for spaces. You just wrote it all in capital letters, really small, without any spaces at all, to get it all in. And of course, none of it was written in English, especially modern English, that you and I would understand. So whenever we quote Christ, like we say, and as Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he, he didn't actually say that. He said, agapeo sai plethathion hos seatu, which we don't speak that language. So if I say, remember that, you'd all be like, I don't even know what that means. And of course, it could be he spoke in either Hebrew or Aramaic, and Matthew, who records that line, said, ugh, they don't speak Aramaic, I'll just translate it to Greek for them, right? So it's always a translation from the original languages. So, of course, we quote him in the language we understand because it's the information that's important, not the fact that he used Greek and we have to quote him exactly. Further, these books were not uploaded to the cloud so that everyone had access to them at once. As each book was written, there was one copy, the copy the author wrote. And then from that copy, we had to make more copies because other people wanted to read it. They said, what did Isaiah say? And I said, eh, let me make you a copy of what Isaiah said. And now you might be thinking, well, that's a bad way because I've copied notes and I'm not good at it. You're absolutely right. You're also not a professional copier. The people who copied scriptures were either scribes or monks whose sole job was to copy scripture, right? Like this was their life and they were really good at it. And of course, there's a supervisor who'd come by and be like, oh, you missed this. And there are other scribes who came after them to be like, whoa, whoa, that's not right and they change it back. So there are very few errors. There are on occasion a small change that happens. For instance, one scribe in the Old Testament changed one of the words for fire to a different word for fire. Because in his head he's, or he saw fire and he wrote the other version of fire. It's like if I change fire to flame. You'd all be like, yep, the story is still the same, but clearly that word is different. But these scribes did this for generation after generation, the meaning doesn't change, but it does mean that there are certain words and certain errors that we see recorded over the course of thousands of years. In fact, it's amazing to me how accurate the Bible is 
when it's been copied for thousands of years. Right? And also, none of these books actually had chapter numbers in them or verse numbers. Have you ever written a letter and said, you know what, this person is going to treasure this letter so much that I'll mark the first paragraph, chapter one, so that then when they refer to it, their friends, they can be like, as my son wrote to me in the second letter to mom, the fourth chapter, verse seven, he said, I love you very much and the kids are doing well. No, that'd be really egotistical if you did that. In fact, the Bible is written, if it was a letter, it was written as a letter. If it was a book of laws, it was written as a book of laws. It's much later, right? The Bible gets written, finished all the books by about 140. And what happens is, it's not until the year like 1200s when somebody says, you think we could put chapters numbers in? And it's not until 1555 that generally verses are added. So when you read Martin Luther, he'll say something like, okay, then we go to John chapter three, you know, for God so loved the world. And he doesn't say, he doesn't not say it's verse 16 because he expects you to know John three so well. He in fact doesn't say verse 16 because nobody's written down verse 16 yet. And yet as people are all reading it and as it comes out so that the masses can read it, they, not having this be their profession and their life, need the verse numbers. They can say, I was reading John and I read this great passage. Somebody would say, in where? And they'd say, chapter 3, verse 16. And then they could read it together. And so that comes much later and it's very helpful for us to have that. Which means that in about 1555, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 37 is numbered. Now we have a class of professionals in the church. We call them textual critics. And they actually go back and they look at how the Bible has been modified and see if we can get back to the original version that the authors wrote. Right? And the closer you get to the original version, the better off you are, because that's the inspired word of God. And the first thing I have to say is, it's amazing how much is the same, right? We keep finding, just a month ago, we found more documents in Israel, and what they'll show is the Bible has not changed very much at all. And the message of salvation, God has preserved it, which I consider one of the miracles of God, that it doesn't change from copy to copy to copy. And yet, verse 38 is one of those verses that when we look back, we said, wait a minute, this is not here in the original manuscripts. In fact, in manuscript P45, and if you get in textual criticism, you will hear lots of numbers like that, but the original manuscript P45, which is in the year 200s, the early 200s, it's not there at all. And yet by the late 200s, we have one of the church fathers referring to it. And so all of a sudden we have this verse 37 that is added to scripture. And so now, most textual critics say, but it wasn't there in the original. Now, part of the good news is you don't hear a lot about, from you about textual criticism. Not because I don't look and see if the text has changed and see if there's something you need to know. It's just so often it doesn't matter. But once in a while, like today, it really matters. Because all of a sudden, verse 37 says something very different. So if you remember the story, here's an Ethiopian eunuch who's a big high official, and he's just been in Jerusalem to worship. Now what you have to know is, if you're an Ethiopian eunuch, you're not a full member of the worship in Jerusalem. First, you're a foreigner. You can't enter most of the holy places. Second, you're a eunuch. And in the Old Testament, if you have crushed testicles or disabled testicles, you can't enter certain parts of the temple. And so this eunuch went all the way from Ethiopia to worship in Jerusalem, and they said to him, you know, we love you and all, we're glad you brought a big offering, but you're not really a full member because of, you know, the Ethiopian thing and, well, because of the eunuch thing. So you can't do everything here. We still like you and all, but you're not full. And so when he is going home, Philip comes up to him and explains all about Jesus and here the Ethiopian eunuch says, well, there's water. What is to stop me from being baptized? And the quick answers are, one, you're Ethiopian. And two, well, you are a eunuch. So of course you can't just be baptized here. But the answer given, as Susan read it, was, 
silence. What does to stop me ask? And God answers with nothing. There is nothing to stop you, which we know because the very next verse, 38, he gets down and he's baptized. And not only that, immediately after he's baptized, the Holy Spirit sweeps Philip away and takes him away to do his next mission. In other words, this guy says, but wait a minute, isn't there something that makes me not being full in the love of God, full in the church, fully able to participate? And God says, nope. I have created it so you are fully loved, you are fully accepted, you are part of this community entirely. And then he's baptized and, he, and Philip is swept away. Now, this verse is added soon after that, right? In sometime in the 200s, because the scribe is probably not a bad guy here. He's reading this and he says, wait a minute, what's to stop me from being baptized? Well, we just can't let anybody join, right? I mean, you've got to have some sort of criteria here. As the church, we've got to make sure that these people are good enough, right? You don't just throw any old meat into the soup. You sniff it first, make sure it's not rancid. So let's add something. And interesting what he adds, he says, well, obviously, in order to join the church, in order to be baptized, in order to be a full member, you have to believe with your whole heart. Now, as churchgoers, we might go, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty, pretty good standard, right? We like that. It's not such a big deal. I say, you have to really believe. And, of course, then the eunuch says, and I do believe that Jesus is Christ, and then he's cleared by Philip. But it changes it, doesn't it? Because in the first case, the, the Ethiopian says to basically God, is there anything to stop me? God says, mm -mm. and he goes on with it. In the second one, all of a sudden, who gives permission? It's Philip, isn't it? All of a sudden, we have changed because Philip is the one who now gives permission. So it's not God, it's now Philip. Which brings us to sort of the infant versus adult baptism, right? If I, as pastor, get to choose and hear that you believe enough and you have all the right beliefs, then I can say, yes, you are qualified and we'll do your baptism. Versus, if God's in charge and there's nothing to stop us, then all of a sudden the Chloe's of the world, the Marilyn's of the world, the Kips of the world, they don't have to be interviewed. This is God's grace, God's love, and it can be given freely to all. And sometimes I think as a church, that still scares us. We're kind of with the scribe who added that verse 37, like, God, of course you love everyone, just let me check them out first. We got to make sure that they're good people. And so when people come and say to us, does God love me? Will God fully accept me? We say, yes, asterisk. And the asterisk might be, as long as you attend service more than uh, half the time. Or the asterisk might be, as long as you continually give to the stewardship campaign. Or the asterisk might be something like, you believe these right things, or you subscribe to this political ideology, or, or, or. And we kind of like that, and yet what this says is no. That's what have been one of our temptations as a church from the beginning. And yet God says, no, what is to stop God from loving the others? What is, God, what is there to stop God from reaching out? And the answer is nothing. God loves them with or without our permission. So we get on board. We welcome them because they are welcomed by the same love of God, by the same grace that saves us. And so when we ask each other, what do you have to do to be loved by God? The answer is nothing. And that's why we celebrate and preach that love to all of God's people. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of the day.
is a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in God's justice, which is forth and liberty. There is no place where sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where feelings have such kindly judgment given. There is welcome for the sinner, and a promise grace made good. There is mercy with the Savior, there is healing in his blood. There is grace enough for thousands of new worlds as great as this. There is room for fresh creations in that upper home of bliss. For the love of God is broader than the measures of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. But we make this love to narrow by false limits of our own, and we magnify its strictness with the zeal God will not own. Tis not all we owe to Jesus, it is something more than all. Greater good because of evil, larger mercy through the fall. Make our love, O oh God, more faithful. Let us take you at your word, and our lives will be thanksgiving for the goodness of the Lord. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Loving shepherd, you know your own and your own know you. Your voice calls us to your loving embrace. 
Strengthen your church, the world, that we bear witness to your expansive love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Gracious shepherd, you are generous with the gifts of goodness and mercy. Restore your creation to wholeness so that cities and towns, countrysides and wilderness may abound with life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Hope-giving shepherd, the nations and people are your heritage. Place into the hearts of all leaders and rulers the passion to serve. Crucify any desire to overpower others and give leaders joy in lifting up the lowly. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Abiding shepherd, your love flows as we reach out to those around us. Move us with your spirit so that we may lay down our lives for those in need. Especially remember Hazel, Marilyn, Ginny, Pastor Heidi, Bruce, Elsie, Myrtle, Wilma, Elaine, Helen, Mary Lou, and Kara. Help us love one another in truth and action. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in the never-ending goodness and mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with the offering of gifts. As you leave, we have the offering plates here. The ways to give online are shown on the screen. We sing the offertory together. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and dreams of all, Unite them with the prayers we offer. Grace our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Please be seated for communion. God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace, grant us peace. 
the King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. With streams of living water flow, my ransom soul he leadeth, and where the verdant pastures grow, with food celestial feedeth. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me, and on his shoulder printly laid, and home rejoicing brought me. In death's dark veil I fear no ill, with thee, dear Lord, beside me. Thy rod and staff my comfort still, Thy cross before to guide me. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. Come, Christians, follow where our captain trod, our King victorious, Christ the Son of God. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. All newborn servants of the crucified bear on their brows the seal of him who died. Lift I the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, Till all the world adore his sacred name. O Lord, once lifted on the glorious tree, As thou hast promised, draw us all to thee. Lift I the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name. So shall our song of triumph 
Please stand to receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. gain 
from you forever with the blessed to retain and hereafter in your glory evermore with you to reign praise and honor to the father praise and honor to the son praise and honor to the spirit ever three and ever one one in might and one in glory while on Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace and share the good news. Alleluia. We will. Thanks be to God.